Amen. Galatians chapter 6. So the last chapter in the book of Galatians. So uh, I really like this chapter. It really kind of wraps up the whole, um, the whole situation that Paul is, is discussing in the book of Galatians. It kind of tells us, it kind of gives us some, some more detail at the end of what actually was going on and for what reason. Um, but he, then he throws in a lot of other different things. And uh, it's just a really good bow on, on, the, on the book of Galatians. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at it. I mean, there's a lot of different subjects here. It probably could have been a, a couple different sermons, but I didn't want to lose the whole idea of the conclusion of Galatians. So Galatians chapter 6, there is some different things that Paul talks about, some different advice, and we'll, we'll apply that as well. But I really want to get a, uh, across the, the point of the chapter and the point of the chapter summing up the book of Galatians. And you know, there's some things there that he tells us on why this happened and why it was going on and what people were actually doing for what reasons that we can really apply and see happening to churches today. You know, we can see the reasons and I'll get into that um, towards the end of the sermon. But look down at verse number one. The Bible says in Galatians chapter six and verse number one, the Bible says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, Restore such an one of, uh, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now look, that, I mean, that's, I mean that's, a, that's a sermon right there. Okay, so first of all, what does he say? So first of all, Paul's, Paul's modus operandi, okay? Paul, if you've read you know, his other letters, um, you know, kind of the way he goes at things is he comes at people really harsh. And then, you know, like in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, but you know, when I come to you, I speak mildly. You know, so he comes at people really hard in letters, and then in many times in other letters, you know, he's kind of like, well, I was hard on you at first, but, you know, now that they've gotten right, you know, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, um, we see some of that. But again, he's sitting here and he's saying, look, you know, and I believe that he may be talking here about the people who got caught up in this folly of this false doctrine. He's saying, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. So there's a lot there where he basically says, you know, if you're spiritual, if you're a spiritual person, you know, you're going you're gonna to give people a chance to get right, is what he's saying. Okay? And he's like saying, look, um, in general, he's like, you know, give people an out, or, or maybe an in is a, better, is a better word, you know, but if you want to, I mean, in general in your life, if you want to make peace, you need to allow an opportunity for people to get right, is what Paul is saying. Look, and, it's, and he says here in verse number one, it's the spiritual people that are meek that will do this. Okay, so it's the spiritual people that are meek that will do this. It's not, you know, um, that will give people a chance to come back, a chance to what he calls restore. Okay, we talked about, you know, how he said in, in previous chapters, and we really went off on that, in, um, in Galatians in previous weeks on how, you know, these people, if you have somebody in the, in the church that's changing the gospel, perverting the gospel, you know, you're supposed to put them out, put them away from you. But here he's saying, hey, you got to, you know, leave people an opportunity to be restored, is what he's saying. You know, so look, and, and, he, and then he says, look what he says here. He says, considering thyself, considering thyself, and this is really the focus of, of Galatians chapter 6 right here, and I hope I get this across. I hope don't, don't go off on too many rabbit trails and I get this across to you here. He says, considering thyself. Meaning, you should allow people, you should be meek, and you should allow people that have even done wrong a chance at restoration for your own sake. Because what could happen? Well, the, be, he says, that lest thou also be tempted. Tempted for what? Well, it tempted to become the opposite of meek. To become the opposite of spiritual. What is that? A, a proud, unspiritual person is what he's saying. So, I mean, consider, you know, yourself. You know, somebody who's just ultra, ultra judgmental on somebody that did something wrong and just leaves, you know, no, I mean, the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall, they, they shall be called the children of God. Look, in life, leave a door open for people, is what Paul is saying here. Look, I mean, if you just, if you have, I mean, just in general, just for life advice, if you want just all-out war with somebody, fine. You don't have to leave a door open. But, I mean, the Bible's not saying that you should go to all-out war with people. Even, look, even, even your own enemies, turn to Proverbs chapter 25, even your own personal enemies, 
Look at Proverbs chapter 25. Even your own personal enemies, look at verse uh, 21 of Proverbs chapter 25. The Bible says, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So look, even your own personal enemies. And look, let me, let me just give you some personal advice. Let me tell you, I'll tell you a personal story. I'll tell you a personal story. Look, in general, personally, in your life, don't burn bridges. Don't burn your bridges down. Let me give you an example, just a secular example of this. Okay? Look, there was a, there was a, a boss that I had out of my first job out of college. I was, I was in the semiconductor design industry. It was a really fast-paced industry where people, hundreds of people would get laid off from different... Con networks were very important. Networks were super important in case, you know, your, your department got cut. You needed to know people so you could go work at a different company or whatever. That's how people got jobs, through networks, not through, you know, online whatever. Okay? But I had this boss... And this boss was probably 30. At the time, he seemed old, but I, you know, I was 21 at the time or whatever. And my boss, I had, it was a really competitive environment too, so people were always leaving and going to other companies. And one of my friends that I worked with, he left and went to another company. Well, my boss didn't like that my friend left, so my boss called me into his office and he said, tell me where John went. And John didn't tell them where he went because he didn't want to cause trouble and he just decided to keep it confidential on where he went to work. And I said, I'm not telling you. And my boss at the time said, tell me or you're fired. And I said, I'm not telling you. Fire me. So, you know, it turned into this thing. And I was, he kind of, ha, 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 laughed it off like it wasn't, you know, as soon as he knew that he wasn't going to be able to scare me into telling me, he laughed it off. But I went to that company like two weeks later. I just left because I was upset over the situation. I was upset that he put me in that situation. I left. And look, I told him why I left. I told him why I left, I told him that he was wrong, and I wasn't quiet about it to anybody else either. I strapped dynamite to the piers of those bridges, and I blew that thing sky high. And look, I mean, this guy was in the wrong, clearly. This manager was in the wrong with what he did. But I blew up that bridge from embankment to embankment. And years went by, because guess what, that guy and I knew mutual people across companies, industries. Years went by. And I saw that guy, and we saw each other at conferences and different things, and there was just this tension all the time. And five, six years after this happened, and look, I know that there were situations where people that I knew didn't get jobs, and because of this, this tension between myself and this guy. He's like, it's his fault. Yeah, it was his fault. But I blew up that bridge. All right? And this guy came up to me like five or six years after this at a conference we were at, and he just he came up to me and he said, and he said, you know, he's like, you know, I was a young manager and I was wrong. He's like, I was wrong and I'm sorry I did that. And at that moment, there was like, the, there was restoration. Look, we're not best friends. We never were best friends. But that restoration happened like five or six years later. But there was tension for five or six years for no reason. I could have just, I could have left quietly. He would have known why I left. He, him and I alone. The restoration would have happened a lot faster. Look, blowing up the bridge did nothing but damage people that we knew. It did nothing but damage people that he knew that I knew and people that I knew that he knew. I mean, it's, it, look, it's, it's just never a good thing. And I, I'm not talking about like, you know, I'm talking about your personal enemies, as Proverbs 25 would say. And the reason that Paul says in, in, in Galatians chapter 6, in verse number 1, that it's a spiritual person with meekness that recognizes this, because look, if I take all my personal enemies and I make them God's enemies, that's a pretty arrogant thing to do. I'm, I'm making myself, you know, at the level of God at that point. So that's why, you know, it takes a meek person to leave a door open for people. And Paul says, you know, leave it. I mean, look, was, was this a small thing that was going on in Galatians? This was a big deal. I mean, Paul was ripping some, ripping some face in previous chapters here. You know, but he says, look, leave, leave a, a door open. Let people have a chance to be restored. And we'll, t we'll talk about um, in coming verses on what actually people, why they did it. Why did these people do it? Were they, you know, devil worshipers or whatever? I mean, why did they do it? 
But anyway, that's just the, the first point. That's just that verse 1, 20 minutes in. But look, the, the thing is, just leave a door open for people. Restoration should always be there. If you're going to blow up bridges, guys, you're going you're gonna to work at different places. You're going to go throughout your life. If, you're gonna, if you burn bridges in your life, you're going to be standing on an island by yourself, is what it boils down to. So don't burn bridges. I mean, that guy was wrong. The guy was wrong in what he did. But, you know, I, I could have I I been the peacemaker there. You know, I could have been the peacemaker. He made a mistake. He got in the flesh. He thought he could... I mean, just think. It was just a dumb thing. He was trying to be the hero to find out where the guy went. Thought he'd throw some weight around or whatever. Um, I mean, whatever. It, wasn't, it didn't make him an evil person. So, don't burn bridges in your life. Verse number two. Bury one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So now Paul starts giving some, some interpersonal, um, some more interpersonal um, advice between um, Christians is really what he's focusing on. Look at verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Now draw a bracket around verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4. Because... Those three things always go together for whatever reason. Those three things. And if you say, well, I don't, I don't understand what you mean. Well, let's look at the opposites of verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4. So Paul is talking about certain things that we should be doing, but let's just think of the opposite. Let's think of someone who is the opposite of verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4. And for some reason, these three things always go together. Verse 2, let's think of the opposite. The opposite is of this is someone who, in verse 2, they won't do anything for anyone but themselves. Verse 3, they think they're great. And verse 4, they're super critical of others. Those three things always come in the same package for whatever reason. In verse 4, they're super critical of others, but they never focus on themselves. And it's funny how all these things go together. Look at verse number 5. Paul continues. For every man shall bear his own burden. Because, look... Verse number 6, Let him that is, is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he always reap. So when he says you shall bear his own burden, he's basically saying, look, you're going to reap your own. He's gonna, you're going to reap. Look, you don't have to worry about others. Look, you have to worry. I mean, this, this is a benefit to you all right here. You have to worry about others a lot less than you think. Because they're going to reap what they sow, and so are you, is what Paul is saying. You know, Hosea 8, 7, very famous verse in the Bible. You know, for they have sown to the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. So Paul is saying, look, don't worry about other people, because they're going to reap what they sow, and so are you. You should be worrying about yourself because of that fact. Look at, uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. As a matter of fact, you say, how am I going to you know, reap what I sow? Because you're going to be rewarded. That's one way. One way is you're going to be rewarded for your work. That's, how, that's one good way that you could reap um, what you sow. You could be rewarded for your good work. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13. The Bible says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So the Bible here is saying that you, you know, you in your life as a saved person in eternity, you are going to either, you know, get great reward, you're going to rejoice in your reward, of, of the things that you did that are, you know, that are manifest in eternity, of the souls that you won, of the, the children that you raised, that, you know, the life that you led that, that had spiritual value to others around you, that is going to be great reward to you. But all the things that you did that don't matter, you're going to suffer loss for that. You're going to know that those things were worthless, that you spent your time on things that you shouldn't have been spending your time on. That's what the Bible is saying here is, you know, you'll suffer loss. So in eternity, even though we're saved, we can, we'll be rewarded in eternity. I don't think about this a lot, personally. 
Because, I mean, I'm just happy to be saved. I'm happy I'm not going to hell. You know, I'm just going to do what I can here on this earth, you know, just because I don't have to go to hell. That's good enough for me, personally. But we will be rewarded, the Bible says, for, for the good works that we do. But if we don't do anything with our lives, which is a lot of Christians, by the way, if we don't do anything, we'll, we'll suffer that loss. Those people will feel that loss in heaven. Look at uh, verse number 9 of Galatians chapter 6. And then Paul says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. He's like, you know, don't, don't get tired in, in the work that you're doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. If you keep going, it's like you'll be rewarded. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. So he's saying here, he's like, just don't, you know, he's like, don't, Get tired, keep going. You're going to get weary, but just keep going. Don't faint. Don't stop. And he's like, especially, I'm focusing especially on you with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Proverbs chapter 3, look at verse 28. The Bible says, Say not unto thy neighbor, Go and come again, and tomorrow I will give. When thou hast it by thee, devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. So he's saying, look, just do good to those around you, especially your saved brothers and sisters in Christ. Even when you get tired. Look at verse number 11. Verse number 11. Now, this is the best part. He's going to now explain to us how he ties this in to, you say, what does this have to do with Galatians? He's been tearing into people for preaching false doctrine, and he comes out and he says, hey, you know, leave, leave room for restoration for people. I get that. But then he goes into this, hey, do good, just worry about yourself, all these things. Now he ties it together right here. You see how large a letter I've written unto you with my own hand? And as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. There's the first reason right there that these people did this in Galatians. There's the first cause of the book of Galatians right there. In Galatians 6, 12, number, you know, just, just pre cause number one right there. These people, they just don't want to be persecuted. They don't want to be persecuted. They don't want to be part of a church. You know, they just wanted to take the Gentiles and just make them Jews. They just wanted to just make them like everybody else. You know, they don't want to suffer persecution. Then look at verse number 13. Here's the second one. And this kind of ties up what he's been talking about when he says, worry about yourself. Because you're going to reap what you sow. They're going to reap what they sow. Why are you worried about other people? Because of this. This is why he's saying this. Verse 13. Neither they themselves who are, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. They're doing exactly, he says, they're doing exactly what I just preached against. They're glorying in other people. So they were, they, you know, they should have been, they should have been worrying about themselves, Paul said. Because you know, they're sitting there and they've added this to salvation and they're not, look, they're not even keeping the law themselves, he says. Look at verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, Peace be on them, and mercy upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I mean, right there, it's like, hey, if anybody could glory in the flesh, it would be me. If anybody could take, you know, glory in what's going on in the flesh, it would be me. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So for, what does he do? He comes out, Paul comes out in, in chapter 6, and he says, look, he's like, worry about yourselves. These people were too worried about others because they were actually wanting to glory in the fact that they were changing the Gentiles. That they were changing, you know, maybe, here's the thing. Here's the thing, and here's how we can apply it to us today and what we see out there today with what people are doing to even Baptist churches. It came, it came from a good place, I'm sure. Maybe you get somebody saved. Think about this. Maybe you get somebody saved. Maybe they come from such a backwards culture like they bring dead raccoons to the potluck 
Right? Well, we grew up in Tennessee, and this is what we eat at potlucks. Dead raccoons. Roadkill. They're bringing all this stuff in, and they come from, they, look, they just wanted to get them circumcised. They just wanted them, it was a custom. It was something that the Jews were just, it was part of their culture, so they were trying to control the actions of the people here, in their minds, for the better. This is how things creep in. This is how things creep in like this. Because look, there's an easy way, look, there's an easy way and a hard way to get people to change. Okay, now follow me here. This is exactly what's going on with Baptist churches today. There's an easy way. See, it'd be hard for me, it'd be hard for me to preach a sermon, you know, teaching. It'd be hard for me to preach sermon after sermon after sermon on what the Bible teaches about on, on just about every subject. It would be hard for me to, I mean, that's a lot of work. I mean, writing all these sermons, and then, you know, studying out the Bible, and then, you know, just preaching these sermons. I mean, you have to write the sermon, you have, you have to study the sermon, you have to write the sermon, then you have to preach the sermon. And then, you know, some people don't listen. You know, some people just don't change. Some people, you can just sit here and you can just preach at them all day long, and they're not going to change. They're going to keep bringing dead raccoons to the potluck. They're going to keep dragging, you know, whatever they find out on the highway and throwing it on the table at the potluck. And you preach, and you preach, and you preach, and you know, but look, here's another thing. Here's another way I could do it. I could say, look, if you don't do these things, you're not saved. You follow me? You follow what these people are doing? Look, they wanted them to be circumcised. They wanted them to stop being this other culture and start looking like them. They, started, they wanted them to start joining their culture so they wouldn't have to go through all this persecution. So they just added it to salvation. I mean, if you don't turn from these things, and I make my little pet list, are you even saved? It's a control play. It's very simple. And it's the easy way. See? It's hard. Look, it's hard to try to persuade you to follow the Bible. Well, it's harder. It's easier just to threaten you with your salvation. It's easier to threaten you with your salvation if you don't do whatever my pet list is. In this case, it was circumcision. I mean, look, I mean, in... in and then, in this case... And I'm sure all other cases that are like this, they got to glory in what they had done in, in the other. See, look, we took these, they're, you know, now they're bringing, um, you know, pot roast instead of roadkill to the potluck. They, they got them to change. They were glorying in that. But what they had really done was led others astray and perverted the gospel. That's what they had really done. And look, I mean, Paul says that they're going to reap what they've sown. I mean, tw verses 12 and 13 really wraps up the entire book of Galatians right there. I mean, unless they, they didn't want to suffer persecution and they wanted to glory that they had changed these people. Those two things right there. That's why they did it. That's why they, that was the motive. You say, why would somebody just come in and just do that? But that was the motive right there. You know, we, we, we know why they, you know, there, there's the, the motive for the crime. The Jews at that time were so critical of the Christians. They were persecuting the church. You know, later the Romans took over the persecution. But they didn't want to go through that, so they were just going to change the Gentiles in, in whatever way that they could. That's exactly what's going on with all this rep uh, repenting your sins, adding works, lordship, salvation. Pick one. Anything that's grace plus works. You know, I mean, it's the Catholic Church. The entire Catholic Church is just a big control play. That's it. I mean, you know, it's a scam. Give me your money, and I'll do this. We'll get your kids in heaven. We'll get your grandparents out of hell. I mean, whatever. You know, I mean, it's just a big control play. But these people did it by changing the gospel, and Paul calls them out for it. So Paul finally gives some parting advice in Galatians chapter 6. He says, worry about yourself. Because what we sow, we will reap. Look, what we sow, folks... We'll reap in this life and the next. The good rewards, you know, the good rewards in heaven 
and the bad, you know, punishment on earth and loss in heaven. That's what we'll reap. For the unsaved, they're going to they're gonna reap damnation is what they're going to reap. And then he says, look, he's like, bear each other's burdens. And especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. Turn to look at back at verse 10. I mean, it's good, it's good parting advice. There's a lot of problems here. He really tore into these people, and he's kind of like trying to, he's giving them the motive of it from the, you know, at the end there, and then he's trying to kind of patch them up a little bit. He's like, restore these people if they get right. Here's why they did it. Restore them if they get right. And he's like, hey, you know, bear each other's burdens, do good to all men, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So what do we see here? We see restore, worry about yourselves, and do good to the brethren. That's what we see here. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I really want to focus for the conclusion here this evening on this idea that he, I mean, he's just like really pushing this self of bearing each other's burdens and, you know, especially to your brothers and sisters in Christ. We heard a sermon a couple weeks ago um, about this, about investing in your brothers and sisters and all this. But I want to give you, a, I want to give you another perspective on this. I want to give you another perspective on this because we hear a lot about this. We hear a lot about this. I mean, you get preached at about how you're supposed to love each other and you're supposed to do good to one another. And you're, if, if you get weary, it says here, you just keep going. Keep going in this. And that's all true. But let me give you another biblical perspective on this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And since we've, you know, You've heard a lot about this, but 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is something we can never forget. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 10. Look what Paul says. He says, And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. He's like, you're going to actually do it, please. For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to the, that man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased, and ye be burdened. You see that? He's saying, look, I'm not just saying that you should just be burdened, and other men should just have it easy. He's like, that's not what I'm saying. And then look what, and you're like, what, 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 you, what in the world? What are you talking about? He's like, what do you mean? Uh, has, aren't I, am, am I not supposed to bear someone else's burdens? Doesn't that mean I'm going to be burdened? If I, if I am just helping Brother Trevor out, and I'm just like, i got to take time off of work, and i got to go and i got to help him on his farm because he doesn't know how to fix anything. No, I'm just kidding. Church mechanic. That's a little church mechanic joke there. Anyway, but just say you're helping one of your brothers out. I mean, obviously, if you're bearing his burden, he's eased, and you're, you're burdened. But Paul says, it, it means, I mean not that other men be eased and ye be burdened, but by an equality. But by an equality that now at this time, your abundance. See, see what it says right there? It says, at this time, at this moment, it says, your abundance may be supply for their want. So it says, in that moment, you are, I'm bearing Brother Trevor's burdens. At that moment, I'm burdened and he's eased, it says. But that their abundance may also be supply for your want. That there may be what? Equality. It's supposed to work both ways, is what the Bible is saying here. As it is written, he that gathered much hath nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. You see, that's how it's supposed to work. Right there. What he's saying is, you know, there's going to be a time when, you know, somebody needs to be eased. And you should be there to be able to ease them. And you can be burdened. But then, there should be a time when I need to be eased. And then I should be helped out and somebody else should be burdened. And then it says in verse 15, and then it will work like this. This is how it will look. Is in verse 15, so it'll, the, the church, the church that acts like this will look like verse 15. 
So you, you, you write next to verse 15. This is how the church should, act, should, should function. He that gathereth much hath nothing over, and he that gathereth little hath no lack. So when I'm down, somebody else picks me up, and when you know, somebody's up, they can, they can help me out. Amen. Look, we're not talking about communism here. This is voluntary helping out your brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's saying, look, it, it's when, and it, and it works like this. It's just this ebb and flow is how it goes. This, that's 2 Corinthians 8, 10. It's an ebb and flow. Because look, here's, here's what I know. Here's what I know. You're going to be up and down in your life. I mean, you're going to have ups and you're going to have downs. If, if you haven't had ups and downs in your life, you haven't, I mean, you're like 12. You're going to have ups and downs in your career. You're going to have ups and downs in your, just your life in general. Your spiritual life is going to have ups and downs, and you're to, you're to bear each other's burdens and all these things. Now, here's the, here's the pragmatic problem in a church. Here's a pragmatic, it's a snowball effect, okay? Because people here preaching, and some people, look, some people hear, and they don't do. That's just, that's just what they do. They hear and they don't do. Other people hear and do. So when you hear all this, this sermons on, on helping out your brothers and sisters and bearing each other's burdens, you get some people who are just like, oh man, I need to start investing in people. I need to start like setting goals and start helping people out. I've been blessed in my life. I need to start doing this. And you have other people, and, and these people just grow. And they just grow because they're doing what they're supposed to do. You know, but then you have the other people that hear and they don't do. And then all of a sudden, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it just, that equality just diverges very quickly. Because you have some people that are just ramping it up. And some people doing nothing. And, you know, but, and the others stand still. Look at verse 14 again. But by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want. It's both ways. You see, look, this is, this is really an American problem right here. This is an American problem that's getting worse every single year. Because you know what? You have this, and, and you know what? Here's what I think. I think it just has to do with how you're raised. I think it has to do with how you're raised. You know, some people, you have to ask yourself, some people are just really, just really comfortable with just taking other people's abundance. That's it. Just all the time. And they're never going to bear anybody else's burdens. So you have to ask yourself, is your abundance ever a supply for anyone else's want? Or is everybody else's abundance only a supply for your want, no matter the time? Because it says, it says that this, there's a time aspect to this. Now, at this time, it says, there may be a moment. You know, I personally don't like people helping me. I've needed help. I'm not saying I've never needed help. I'm so strong, I've never been down. No, but when I've needed help, it kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. That's kind of how you should be. It should kind of make you uncomfortable. But you know what? You should really want to help other people. I mean, are, are people constantly doing things for you? Are people constantly paying for things for you, providing things for you? I mean, people like this match the description of verse 3 in Galatians 6. For a man thinks himself to be something, he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Many times people like this, they think, well, my mere presence I'm serious. My mere presence is payment enough for everything that you have done for me. <laughs> but that, that's, that's exactly what verse 2, 3, and 4 is talking about in Galatians chapter 6. I mean, look, you have to bear each other's burdens, but it, this thing should ebb and flow. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. And I, this is an example I just thought of. There's no indication that there's any problem here, and if there is a problem, it's a small one. But this is just an example. The guys are taking a lot of trips. This is an example of something that reminded me of when I was younger. The single guys are taking a lot of trips. Somebody's driving on the trip. Are you often to pay for gas? Yeah, that's good. Are you often to throw in money for gas? Or are you just like, my mere presence? 
is payment. It will run this car. <laughs> it's a small thing. And maybe everyone does. I have no idea if anyone does or doesn't. But that's, that's just a small thing. Look, I mean, this kind of mentality is, is a disease in our country right now. That just everyone should just do things for me for nothing. It is a sickness that is wrecking our society. And 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is preaching against it. At least in the church anyway. It shouldn't happen here. You should strive. Look, you should strive for this equality. Look, an equality is not a bad word in this sense. You hear some politicians saying equality and you're like, ah! You know, <laughs> this isn't going anywhere good. But this is talking about equality in helping each other. Equality in bearing each other's burdens. And I mean, actually, you know, if you think about it, I mean, imagine a church that actually operated this way. You're going to be down. I'm going to be down. Imagine a church that actually operated this way. Where like really no one ever, anyone ever was, had want for anything. And really no one, you know, really had abundance for anything. Because, you know, we're just kind of, you know, when you're down, I'm helping you out, and when I'm down, you're helping me out, and this and that. But look, it's talking. It, look, it's actually talking about worldly needs too. By the way, it's not. You know, it's talking about worldly needs, like a supply. You know, just just hunger. You know, clothing, food, resources. Look, you need to take an accounting in your lives on what people have provided you, your wants, and do they equal their wants? That that's what you, I'm asking you to do tonight. Just take an accounting. Is it equal? Is it even close? Because some people, they're just going to, look, some people, and this is never going to change because people, and I'm thankful that this is never going to change, some people are just going to give and give and give and give. And I'm thankful that that's never going to change. Because that means that you're actually listening to what I'm saying. <laughs> that you're actually listening to the Bible. And you know what? It's in their blood. They were raised that way. They were raised that way. And others, and I'm sorry, this comes from how you were raised. That's been my experience in my life. It comes from how you were raised. Others were just raised with people just doing everything for them in their life. That's why, you know what, don't do everything for your kids. Don't just raise these kids who are just constantly just, you know, you just do everything for them. You make every excuse for them. You do everything for them. You give them everything. You're going to raise one of these people. They come into a church or come into, you know, relationships and just want everything done for them. There's no equality there. Look, and it, here's the thing. You're like, well, I was raised that way. You shouldn't care how you were raised. You shouldn't care how you were raised. That's the answer. You're like, I just, you know, my parents just never taught me this. or Whatever. whatever. You're being taught now. Just listen to what the Bible says. Like, that's with everything. That's with everything. I mean, people come here, and I get it. They come, and they sit down here, and they hear something, and they're just like, I mean, they're just like, what in the world? And they feel like they got hit by a train. I get it. But you have to get yourself to a point. If you want to grow or go or move anywhere, you just got to be like, you know what? I know I was raised this way. I know I grew up wearing this stuff. I know this was my culture. You just got to be like, the Bible says this. I'm just going to do it. Or, you know, that's just what you got to do. And if you don't do that, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to stand still in your Christian life. I mean, what a waste. What a waste of time. Just, I mean, just listen. Just listen to the Bible and change. Or are you even saved? You see what I did there? <laughs> Galatians. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.